Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1 tonight, and we're going to look at verses 35 through 39 tonight. Appreciate you being with us, and especially our guests. I trust you already feel welcomed and uh, excited to hear what God's doing here. And uh, Mark chapter 1 tonight, we're going to begin in verse 35. And we've been looking at this series, Busyness uh, versus Godliness. And uh, so I want to talk a bit tonight about maybe how you can manage time with a little different perspective than maybe you have to this point. And uh, hopefully a blessing to you in the context of your family, uh, your work, <coughs> excuse me, as well as ministry and other things God has entrusted to you. Let's stand together if you're able to do so. If you need a Bible, there should be one near you there. Mark chapter 1, let's begin in verse uh, 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he, this is Christ, went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. And so tonight we want to talk about this subject, busy wandering. We've been dealing with symptoms of busyness that counters our godliness. And tonight just talk about how we wander because we're overly busy and overly extended. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you tonight for the privilege to be here. Lord, I am uh, just thrilled and humbled by what you're doing in our midst, and I give you alone glory for that. But Lord, I thank you for each person that shares in what you're doing here, those right now serving and prepping our fellowship and meal afterwards tonight, and uh, just many, Lord, that are here tonight uh, by way of commitment. They may not feel like being here. They may have other things that could take up this time slot, and Lord, I thank you for their wise stewardship and being here tonight. Thank you especially for our first-time guests and others, Lord, we've just begun to know and to fellowship with. Pray you strengthen them as well as our faithful regulars tonight. Lord, help us where we lack clarity and direction, and to help that to be um, addressed tonight and uh, just purified and refined through your word and spirit. And we will thank you and praise you for what's accomplished in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you're tracking the news at all. If you are at all, you know we have a slight astronomical um, event tomorrow. Um, I think I heard the uh, solar eclipse is happening at what, about 107? Does that sound about right in our local time? Um, I don't know that we're right in the path of a complete eclipse as far as that. You'll see the ring of fire or whatever, you know, as the moon uh, comes between the earth and the sun. But one of the things that was interesting to me was, and I haven't asked Miss Brandy, who works in an ER in our area, um, but I was reading an article was saying that ERs are preparing for the fallout of that. I can't believe that something happening, how many millions you know, light years away could affect us on Earth. But they said uh, these kind of things actually can and burn the retina you know, after the fact. Um, they said also a lot of times there's, uh, it's the first time since 1918 there's been a solar eclipse across the continental United States where you can observe it all the way from Oregon to uh, Carolinas. And they were saying that right in the main path where you see the complete eclipse, that those towns are going to be inundated with traffic. So they're talking about even just fender benders, car accidents, people all thronging to these areas. I have a good friend of mine who's traveling to somewhere out west to be there by tomorrow. And he's just, I'm like, what do you have going on that you can drop everything to go watch the sun, you know? But that, that's me. I probably I'm overly busy. That's my confession. I don't have time to, you know, track the heavens. Uh, but it was interesting to me that the, the focus upon the heavens caused a bit of maybe um, flightiness or not focus upon what's going on right in front of you. Here's the truth tonight before we get into the specifics. I find often we don't set out on purpose to crash and burn whether that be physically, emotionally, or spiritually. But here's how we end up doing it. We just wander into it. Our days become weeks. Our weeks become months of mismanaging our time. Our priorities are out of whack. And most of those I know who have known God and walk with God and have been close to the Lord that have fallen on hard times spiritually wandered there. So I want to give you a few truths tonight, things that I think will probably give you a greater focus upon the day-to-day -day management of your time, and to see it maybe from God's perspective, from a, a heavenly view, that may change some of how you go about managing your time and your priorities. Now here in our text tonight, we have the example of Jesus Christ, His earthly ministry um, goes from zero <laughs> to 60 rather quickly uh, after the turning of water into wine in Cana. 
And he is inundated with demands and expectations. And found in verses 35 to 39, we find the secret to Christ being able to stay on mission. Um, it's a call to prayer. We're not going to really study on that this evening. But you find how he stayed in, in focus uh, upon the will of God, the will of the Father in his life with all the demands that were loaded upon him. In fact, you could jot this down in your notes. Sometime, just go through Mark and circle every time the word immediately is found. Over and over in the book of, of Mark, and immediately this happened, and then immediately this happened. In, in three and a half years, literally, Jesus Christ, it was just one thing after another after another. How did he, in the midst of that, day after day, week after week, how did he do the will of the Father in a very focused manner? So that's what we want to unpack for just a few moments uh, this evening. How do we avoid wandering around this earth and instead lock in upon the will of our Heavenly Father. I want to give you three guiding convictions that we see in these couple of verses that kept Christ on mission and I believe can help us stay on mission as well. Number one, first of all, these are just three simple statements, our outlines on the back of the bulletin that you should have tonight. Feel free to fill in the blanks if that helps you. Number one, here is the first conviction that guides us when we are tempted to wander. I must set priorities because of personal limitations. I must set priorities because of personal limitations. The other day it popped up in my news feed an advertisement for Oreos, specifically the Oreos that are the thin ones. I'm of the generation where it was double thick. You know, they kept making the filling on Oreos thicker and thicker, and now we're moving the other direction, I think kind of to be more health conscious. You know, I'm amazed at what the fast food joints are doing to try it. We have salads, and we have all this, and you still see people all have a supersized number eight with extra cheese and bacon. You know, that's, they, they do that in advertising, but then if you go there, you still get the unhealthy options. But Oreo thins, and their slogan, what struck me was this. It said this, these three words, crisp thin, delicate. And I don't know that we realize tonight how delicate, delicate our lives are, how thin and narrow that window is of opportunity. We're very limited in the time we have, the energy we have, the opportunities that we have, and so we must get our priorities in order to make sure we do all that God has entrusted to us. All right, how do we do that? Let me give you a couple areas where we're limited, and I don't know that we act like we are. First of all, look at verse 35. It says this, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out. Jot down these two things. They're not on the slides tonight, but here are two areas in which we are limited that should cause us to set greater priorities. Number one, we're limited in our time. A great while before day. The person who never sets priorities is the person who does not honestly believe they're finite. You can say, oh yeah, I'm limited and I'm weak and I'm feeble, but if you don't structure your life with great clarity and conviction, you really don't believe you're finite. I've said this before. Can you imagine going to a sporting event with no clock, um, no restrictions? The, it just goes on and on. My brother, I remember when he was back this most recent time, he's in London as a missionary, they would go to, to uh, cricket games and they would just go on and on and on. It was an all-day event. There's a clock ticking, and we have to work within the time restraints, uh, constraints of what God has given to us. And so we must set priorities because of limited time. Um, most of us work within that restraint when it comes to money, don't we? We don't go out and buy everything because we know we have limited money. But for some reason with time, we just squander a day and don't even give it a second thought. There's no price for it. There's no marginal utility curve for it. Moreover, time is totally perishable and cannot be stored. Yesterday's time is gone forever and will never come back. Time is therefore always an exceedingly short supply. You can't stretch it. You get the same hours every day. And I think sometimes the way we manage our days, uh, we forget that, at least in the practical. Time may be scarce, uh, scarce. It may be our most precious resource. We need to manage it with God's priorities um, in mind. All right, secondly, if you will, notice back in verse 35, a second limitation that we must address. And he, notice this, departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Number two, and this is key this evening, you have limited focus. You have limited time. Number two, you have limited focus. And here's the truth. You can only do really one thing at a time. 
Um, Christ recognized that I have to remove the distractions. I have to draw apart and lock in upon the Lord and focus exclusively uh, upon Him. Um, in reality, we cannot do two things at once that require equal mental focus. Um, you can sit on a couch and eat potato chips while you watch TV, but try writing a paper while having a meaningful conversation with somebody. Your brain actually, and computers do the same thing. I was reading an article the other day talking about it. We actually switch task. It's not that we multitask. We switch task. We shut down a little bit so we can manage this more. But your brain really can only handle one thing fully at a time. So I think we need to be very careful in how we fragment our focus and realize we have limited ability to focus in what we're doing and what we're focused upon. Um, Jesus Christ didn't, could not meet all the needs around him. He had to get away to pray and to recalibrate, um, and as he did so, he began to sense God's leading in his life. All right, number two, if you will, now go down to verse 36. And notice the second area uh, that really demands of us to set priorities in this area of our limitations. Verse 36, And Simon and they that were with him followed after him, and when they found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. Number two, I must set priorities despite the opinion of others. So I must set priorities because of my own personal limitations. Number two, I must set priorities despite others' opinions. Um, I have always been, I think I mentioned to you before, my toothbrush issues. Some of you, by the way, were asking for the picture I talked about this morning. You will never see that. In fact, it was burned this afternoon in a large ceremony. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I was talking about a picture from my elementary school with no bicep holding a basketball and a sports picture that I dread to see every time it's, it's opened up. But one of my issues with toothbrushes, I don't like the bristles of my brush touching anybody else's bristles in our house, even my dear wife. I just, I like my own bristle space. Um, and the other day at Walmart, there was a, an automated one for sale. It was like on sale. I'm like, I've been hearing good things about these. I think I'm going to try out one, you know, the rechargeable type. It's, it's interesting to try that. Have you ever done it for the first time? You feel like it's going to get away from you and I'll have no teeth left at the end of this, you know, and um, it, it, it's just, and, and everybody's, but you ought to have one. My wife's had one for years. My boys have them. And finally I tried them. I'm not sure if I'm going to stay in that trajectory with my toothbrush or not, but I was doing it because others think it's something that I should do. I think a lot of us get ourselves in trouble not by how we manage our time, but how others view how we manage our time, specifically in a negative way. And I think we have to be very careful in how we handle criticism or comments. And Jesus Christ had, a, had a, just a focus to push through those distractions. All right, what are a couple of ways that the opinion of others can, can get us out of where we should be with our priorities? First of all, in verse 36, you notice Simon and they that were with him, <laughs> excuse me, followed after him. Number one, you'll often have, jot down these couple of thoughts, opinionated invasion. People who invade your life with their opinion, their perspective, their evaluation of how you're doing and what you're doing. Um, and we have to guard against that in a way that would distract us. Um, the apostles wake up, all right? They were still sleeping when Christ was praying, and they followed after him, but they didn't follow after him to learn how to pray. They followed after him to tell him how he should be managing his time. And they invaded his space. Think about this. They walked in on a conversation between God the Son and God the Father and said, we know better what you guys should be doing right now. That's how obstinate our business can become. We're arguing with God about what should be the priority in any given situation. And it's interesting that ultimately I think Jesus Christ, whenever he was invaded upon, he saw that in a spiritual level. Um, it's interesting that he withdrew into a wilderness place just like he did when he was confronted and invaded by, by the devil with the temptations. And I think often busyness really has its source in that which is dark and that which is anti-God, spiritually speaking. Um, there's a story out of Shreve. Did you see this this past week? Um, a playground, um, River of Life Fellowship Church in Shreve, uh, on this past Monday, somebody burnt down their playground. Um, and somebody saw these, they believe, two boys, and one of them right the last second as the whole thing's in flames. It burnt all the wood, melted the rubber, chip rubber, and the plastic slides and things. They were taking pictures of it, laughing. Um, th there are people out there that just want, they just want to insert mayhem. Um, and I think often we let the opinions and, and the negativity of others really creep in upon what should be peace 
solitude and relationship and focus upon the Lord. So we must guard against that, and we must set priorities to keep that uh, in front of us. The convicting truth tonight is that you and I are more responsible for what we allow to invade into our lives than we would care to admit. Let's be honest this evening. We do care too much what other people think. The way we go about our lives shouts that. We do care. We say we don't. We claim we don't. But a lot of what we do is, is just, it's just prop. It's just profile. It's just trying to be or to keep up with so-and-so. And I think we need to turn to the Lord and say, God, your opinion is all that matters. Uh, I've tried to grow in that as a pastor and as a parent and husband. Just, God, would you say well done right now? And let that give clarity in the midst of all the busyness that often swirls around us. Um, and here's just a temptation I have when I read through these passages, don't you, to think, well, Christ didn't deal with the things I deal with. He didn't have the pressures that I have. We may not say that because that doesn't sound right, but we act like he could not relate. One author said this, don't you think Jesus can sympathize with your business? You have bills that need to be paid. Jesus had lepers who wanted to be healed. You have kids screaming for you. Jesus had demons calling him by name. You have stress in your life. Jesus taught large crowds all over Judea and Galilee with people constantly trying to touch him, trick him, and kill him. He had every reason to be run over by a hundred expectations and a thousand great opportunities, and yet he stayed on mission. And so if Christ has given us that example, we must follow it, and we do so by keeping our priorities Christ-honoring. And I have found this to be a help. I alluded to this statement this morning. I got this morning's sermon, and tonight's a bit jumbled in my mind this morning, but an author I recently read said this, quote, nothing bothers an unjust critic more than ignoring them. It wisely says, quote, your opinion is of no value to my life mission. We don't like that they don't appreciate it. It bothers us, but when it comes to our mission, it's irrelevant. That's the kind of focus we need to not get overly busy and to keep our priorities pleasing uh, to the Lord. All right, verse 37 all right, so they find him. Notice verse 37. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. Number two, jot this down. Opinionated, not only invasion, but opinionated neediness. <clears throat> opinionated neediness. Um, the other day I saw um, Tony Studer posted on Facebook a um, little interesting antidote from their family. She said... Uh, we saw a couple of skydivers jump out of an airplane while we were driving this morning. I think it was like a week or so ago. Um, and she said, on the way home, Annabelle said, quote, let me know if you see any planes that shoot people out. That was her, just let me know if you see any others. Don't you wish sometimes you could just shoot out a few people out of your life that, that just the noise and the, the distraction that's there, the needs, I just need you to do and I just... I have this one thing I need, and the neediness, the neediness, the neediness. Jesus constantly dealt with that. There were needs that he didn't meet. There were, there were burdens that he didn't bear, and he was willing to cut through that and to seek the Lord's leading in his life. By the way, the, there's two words found there. I love this wording where they say to him, all men seek for thee. All men. Um, I'd be very careful when you feel pressures like that. Everybody needs you to. Everybody thinks you should. Everybody's depending upon, everybody's counting on you. That, that, that ought to be a red flag many times. Everybody needs, all men need. Um, what about what God is calling us to do? We have to be very careful with neediness uh, that swirls around us. We care, we pray, but we seek the Lord and what he would have us do in that area of need. By the way, if you've not jotted this down yet or not made a note, I believe this with all my heart, a need does not necessarily necessitate a personal call. Um, you have to be very careful with that. A need does not necessarily necessitate a personal call. Just because there's a need, we still turn to the Lord. And I he deal with this regularly in our church. We get phone calls of very heart-wrenching type of situations, and we want to help. But I always will say to them, or have one of our staff guys say, we'll pray about it, and we're not trying to deflect somebody by saying that. We'll consult with our leadership team, and if we are led to help or able to help, we will reach back out to you. Um, so we have to work at that and be very careful not to become overwhelmed with needs and let that be what directs us um, in the here and now. Some of you in your families, that's how you're dealing with things in your family. If there's a need, you just do something. Um, if there's a need in the work setting, if there's a need in the church, you just automatically do something. 
um, instead of seeking the Lord. All right, go to Mark chapter 9 for a moment, and here we find the disciples who thought they had it all figured out were actually the fools when it came to the value of what was being done in the area of importance. Christ was praying. They thought he ought to do something. And we find out they were the ones who were wrong. Mark chapter 9. And if you would please look at verse 14. Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. All right, later on in the story, Christ here it says, And when he was come to his disciples... He saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question he with them? And verse 17, one of the multitude answered, said, Master, I have brought thee unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, foameth, and uh, gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer uh, you? Bring him unto me. So the disciples had tried to cast out this demon. And just to summarize the story, Christ then turns, he cast out the demon. And notice now in verse 28, and when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind cannot, uh, can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And I think sometimes what's happening is we're trying to meet needs so much that we're losing the ability to actually meet the need. Um, we're not talking about that it's, it's about me selfishly bunkering down and not helping people. It's I'm managing my time so that I'm robustly able to step forward and meet the need that God has called me to meet. Managing of time through prayer through fasting, through seeking the Lord, and now I'm able, not because of the opinion, not because of the need, but because of God's leading and power, I'm able to bring that to bear in the situation. A fascinating story that came out of Cuba this last week of some of our diplomats. Did you see this? They're going deaf, and here they found out that someone in Cuba had been using a a supersonic type of secret weapon and, and was sending these pulses into the residence of our ambassadors and representatives, and they're going deaf because of it. Um, And they were saying that they they were unaware of it, these folks living there. I think sometimes we're we're, we're losing our vitality, we're losing our strength because we're so focused on needs, we've lost the Lord. We've lost the Spirit. We've lost the daily renewal that we need to then be able to turn and meet the needs of others. Now, by the way, just a side note here. On the other side of this, we need to be willing to respect that others cannot do everything for us we want them to. Um, You ever get offended when someone says, I'm just too busy right now to help you with that? What do you want them to say to you? I don't don't have time for you because you're not as important as whatever, you know. There's a reason why sometimes folks say no to lunch, why folks say no to something you would like them to do. We need to also be respectful of each other in that area. And not pile on and and be pushy or demanding. We need to respect that God is leading and working in each heart and life. One author I was reading said this, Unless we're God, none of us deserve to be the priority for everyone else all the time. Um, That's not us. And so we need to be willing to trust the Lord with that. All right, lastly, go back to our text. And let's look at a third, um, I guess, if you will, motivation um, to make sure that we're not wandering. This is a conviction we must have. Number one, because of personal limitations, I'll set priorities. Number two, because of or despite others' opinions, I will set priorities. And thirdly, if you will now look at verse 38. <clears throat> verse 38. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. Thirdly, I must set priorities for more effective service. I must set priorities for more effective service. Um, you ever been to, it uh, seems like most time for me it's Kohl's, um, and they get done, they give you a receipt, and they say basically to this effect, congratulations, you just saved $3,455. Have you ever had that? And you're like, yeah, right. It's always on sale. You know, I, I have had this dialogue with my wife for years. You know, It's 40% off, and then you get another thing in the mail for 40% off. Probably cost them 10 cents to make, and now it's on sale. You know, and It's amazing how many thousands of dollars I've saved by spending thousands of dollars at Kohl's. 
or my wife has. And uh, it, it's just amazing that the, the, they focus on that. Um, can I ask you a question this evening? Imagine how your life would change if you could cut down on quantity and by doing so elevate the quality of your service. See, I think sometimes we're, we're content with just doing a lot of stuff instead of doing well what God has given us. Uh, and so I think we need to give some thought to that, where maybe we can shift from just doing a ton to doing what God has led us to do and doing it with effectiveness. All right, two things I will give you quickly and we're done. Number one, it needs to be, and the motivation should be in our priorities, to have advanced effectiveness. Advanced effectiveness. Notice he says in verse 38, and he said to him, let us go into, notice this word, the next towns that I may preach there also for therefore came I forth and so it's about the next um, I have found in my life many times how I manage my time is all about just the urgent the tyranny of the urgent what's right now instead of managing my time with also consideration for what's next do you remember me saying this morning that good leaders think about what's going to happen next Great leaders think about what's going to happen after what happens next. I think we need to manage our time with that in view. Some of you, it's your own estate planning. It's, it's your, your family management. It's, it's ministry, long trajectory plans that you need to give some time to that. Thinking about where is this going and making sure you're prepared for the next step that God would have for you. Stewarding our time is not about just pursuing things I like to do. It's about becoming more effective in serving others. Um, one article I was reading talked about posterities instead of priorities. Posterities would be things you say no to. That's always at the bottom of the list. Do you have things you know you're not able to do? Do you have things you're willing to say no to so that you might say yes to the effect of things God has led you to do? All right, number two, look at verse 39. So God has some things next for us, and make sure you're managing your time with that in view. Verse 39, he preached in their synagogues, throw out all Galilee, and cast out devils. Number two, secondly, jot this down, influential effectiveness. Influential effectiveness. <clears throat> the other day I was reading our time about fidget spinners. I don't know, most of the kids probably have them. Landon got his first one uh, yesterday's birthday. I don't know that I've said it's wrong to have them, but I'm not a huge, necessarily a huge fan of them. But he got his first one um, yesterday. And there was an article about ones that are battery powered. They actually have um, speakers in them sometimes and just lights and things. And they're actually, in, they're catching on fire while they're charging. Similar to what, what were those little razor, um, whatever things, hoverboards or what, I don't, sorry. Uh, but anyway, those things, and, and the batteries are like catching on fire at night while they're charging. And they were warning, consumer watchdogs were warning kids to be careful of that, the ones that plug in. Sometimes I think we're, we feel like we're just spinning. Um, and I think the reason that's the sensation is because we've forgotten we're called to impact people. And specifically, not just the people we already know, but new people. We can focus on the people that, that the disciples wanted to reach in the text back in verse 35, can't we, or verse 36. But what about the people in Galilee? What about the other people that God wanted to reach through Jesus Christ? I think sometimes we forget that there are others and there's expanding areas of influence that God may have for us. New people were called to influence. Manage your time with that in view. Jesus cut to the chase with his reply. They said, let's go back and do these things. And what does he say? Let's go to the next town. He, he, didn't, even, he didn't even engage. He just kept focused on what God had next for him and those he was yet to influence. By the way, it was not about the healing. It wasn't about the show. It was about what? the preaching of the gospel, the kingdom, and uh, all the miracles were only to validate what he was preaching um, and teaching. Um, right now, this is dear and near and dear to my heart because I'm going through some restructuring of my own time management and ministry philosophy to free up time to reach more people, um, to reach them with the gospel. Um, it's not easy how I structure my day and things I'm working on and addressing in my own selfishness and pride and convenience. And many of you in the room need to do the same thing. Here, what you're doing now is okay if you're only going to influence the same people. What if he's going to expand your potential for the kingdom of Christ? What if he's going to reach through you more people? What you're doing now won't work. And so we need to be willing to grow and expand for what God has next 
for each of us that are here tonight. Um, by the way, the word you see used in this last point tonight is not efficient, it's effective. When you reach people and minister to them, that's never efficient. It's messy, it's time-consuming, it, it drains you of energy. Uh, we're not saying it'll be easy, but it is effective. It's reaching the people God has led you to reach. Can I give you a statement tonight as we finish that has been working in my life, and maybe we'll do the same in yours? Would you jot this down? <clears throat> Here's the statement. Someone said this, My stress, and I would underline the word stress, My stress is almost always an indicator of where I have not surrendered. And I would underline the word surrendered. My stress is almost always an indicator of where I have not surrendered. And here's the, the supposition or the proposal this evening. <clears throat> the reason you're overwhelmed if you are tonight is because God is not the one directing you. I have found at times when I'm following God, I'm tired, but I can't remember a time I was stressed in the sense that there was that gnawing uneasiness in my heart and soul because I was doing His will. He was the one in the driver's seat. He was the one in control. It wasn't me. But when I take control of my schedule and start cramming it with everything I can pack into it, that's when the stress comes in. May we surrender. May we follow the directives of the God that loves us and cares for us. And with that, replace busy wandering with peaceful, steady surrender to his leading. What's striking to me about Jesus Christ is that he had all kinds of reasons to be sinfully busy, to be stressed, to be flippant or kind of cursory toward people, and he never was. He was always tender. He was always focused. He was always right on point. His tone was right. His pace was right. Everything was perfect, and he did it because he focused upon the will of the Father. Jesus knew the difference between the urgent and the important. He understood that not all good things uh, that could be done should be done in his life. And so the question tonight is this, will you set God-directed priorities because of personal limitations? You can't do it all. Just come to terms with that. Number two, despite others' opinions. And thirdly, four, more effective service. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, thank you for...